So one of the most compelling stories from your book uh, that I found engrossing was the story of a guy named Damien Patton. Mm -hmm. And so Damien Patton's a young Jewish boy, kind of mm -hmm. lost soul. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then he winds up being radicalized mm -hmm. and joins a white supremacist group. Yep. Uh, even participates, becomes something of a young star and leader. Yep. Yep. Uh, and it's obviously um, something that people don't even imagine possible uh, that where they didn't know he was Jewish. Yeah, that's right. And he was concerned that he'd be outed as Jewish. Like he brought one of his new friends home and then his mom's like, what the hell? You're like, you're a skinhead, you're Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and then he had to deny it. Um, so I, I thought this story was so powerful and humanizing because what, what it showed was that this radicalization uh, can prey upon or, or it, 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 it feels like a human need that people have yeah. almost regardless of background. That's right. I mean, I think people yearn for community, right? especially that lost soul, you know, is so eager to find a welcoming group where he or she can fit in. And in Damien's case, he was from a broken home, didn't have strong role models, found himself kind of attracted to gangs, first like Latino gangs, because he had a friend who was Hispanic, and then eventually got pulled into the white supremacist movement. And it's extraordinary to think that someone again could deny who they were and get pulled into something so toxic and clearly like self-destructive, but he did. And not only did he get involved with them, he traveled from Southern California to Tennessee. They committed a crime. He was in the car with two adults when he was still a, a, a minor and they shot up a synagogue. You know, thankfully no one was killed, but not for lack of effort. And uh, they were arrested and they were arrested indicted and sentenced, but he was a minor. So as the two guys went to prison, he was let off. And then he went on to join the military, moved, found community there, eventually found out he was pretty good at coding, built a successful tech company, venture backed on his way to an IPO in the burgeoning tech scene in Salt Lake City, where there's some really, some interesting stuff yeah. happening. And uh, got, but got outed. Some investigative reporter found out his past, which Damien had never come clean about. And he was outed and he was humiliated and he was literally fired from the company that he built with his bare hands from the ground up and relieved none of his responsibilities as CEO, pushed out entirely by the board. Yeah. So I, I think this is really important because this is about when you met him, when he yeah. came to your attention. Yeah. So someone in their distant past, their adolescence, is affiliated or is a white supremacist, yeah. uh, serves in the military, goes on to become a business leader, uh, years and years pass, and then someone produces uh, records being like, hey, this person uh, was a white supremacist, yes. has tattoos to that effect. Yeah. Um, and so if you just look at that headline, you just think, well, well, th this person's terrible because you know, like they, they were an active white supremacist. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this person had had like a, a completely different life arc, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I mean, he had a family. Yeah. Yeah. Which happened obviously after he was long uh, after, yeah, yeah. Lo long after. And so then the company looks at him and says, well, you got to go because like we can't have like a white supremacist founder, uh, you know, that that's going to like destroy the company. Like, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to go public. Yeah. Um, and then he's looking at it like, look, this is a part of my life that has like not been a part of my life yeah. for decades and decades. Yeah. And so when you were brought in to talk to him, you know, like, and it was one of the things I admired about uh, both, you know, your account in the book um, and your work is that you treated him like a human being. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I deserve credit for that. I think that's the basic. Uh, what happened was a friend of mine, because you know, I worked in Silicon Valley for many years who was a venture capitalist, which was a Jewish fellow, uh, called me and said, hey, Jonathan, I know this. I'm an investor in this guy's company. It's a crazy story. Would you talk to him? So first of all, he had a valid introduction from someone that I trusted. Yep. But I also called him because, like, you know, Nick Cannon, who's a friend, has this phrase that he uses, which I've wholesale adopted uh, and take credit for. <laughs> Uh, he says he doesn't believe in cancel culture. He believes in council culture. And I think there's so much truth to that. 
So in Damien's case, yeah, he erred. Yeah, he sinned. But if you, like, look, I'm Jewish. I believe that we're all created in God's image, but we're not God. We're imperfect, and we err, and we make mistakes. And the, the thing is, can you learn from those mistakes? Can you rep- Are you willing to acknowledge the error, apologize maybe to those you've hurt, and repent? And so I called this fellow and said, it, and look, the first conversation we had, we, it, was a, it was a phone call. He was at an airport in Long Beach, and he was basically speechless. I say, I'm just calling to reach out, let you know I'm here. I'm happy to talk to you. And then we got on a Zoom like a couple days later, Andrew, and he was glassy-eyed and trying to make sense of what well, was he, happening he'd, to his he'd life. He'd seen his reputation uh, destroyed and his, his life completely upended. The whole, his every, exactly. It was like he was literally in a building and the entire building was burning down around him and he had no way out. And then we talked again a week later and then a week later and a week later. And then the weeks became months and the months became years. And I've talked to Damien, not quite every week, but you know, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of weeks. And I did that because I've watched him evolve and grow. Not just, you know, what's the word? Like not just externally, you know, again, from a white supremacist who joins the Navy, who becomes a coder and an entrepreneur and a CEO, but like internally as a person who's reckoned with his past and resolved himself to do better. And I, I don't, I think as head of the ADL, like, yeah, I deal with big geopolitical issues and whatnot, but I also, like, I'm a human being. And so helping him find his path has been one of the most rewarding experiences I've had in this job. Uh, I think council culture should be the new norm and standard. 100%. Uh, and it's one uh, one thing uh, that I, I admire about uh, what you advocate in your book um, which is that, look, there has to be a path to uh, understanding or redemption uh, for people that want it. I mean, if someone that's doesn't right. want it. No, that's really important. Like, if you are a serial offender, if you are unwilling to acknowledge what you've done, what you're doing, if you will only listen to yourself and the counsel of the people that you trust rather than those who you've hurt, like, look, that's a different story. Like, I don't have patience for people who, uh, you know, continue to offend. But if you're willing to try, I think it's up to the rest of us to be willing to help you. It, you know, I don't know. I shouldn't say that for everyone. But I think it's my job. And I think it's those of us in public life, Andrew, can always do better. So we talked about how there was this wave of democratization and then it seems to be reversing. Uh, and... Uh, a woman I spoke to recently, Barbara Walter, wrote a book. Oh yeah, that suggests a civil war stuff. Yeah, that that suggests that social media might be part of the reversal. Yeah, uh, that there is something of a negative correlation between uh, social media adoption and democratization, which was a, a very, uh, you know, striking negative correlation. Um, you started uh, an anti Facebook campaign. Yeah. Um, that was the biggest, most significant effort I've seen. Yeah, you got uh, dozens of major corporations uh, to get on board. What catalyzed that effort? So, first of all, I would just recognize like Professor Walter, like she's a professor at UCSD. Like, I really admire her scholarship, and her book is terrific. Uh, and I think there's something to what she said about the pernicious role of social media. So when I joined ADL, you know, again, I had worked in the Valley. I had worked inside Google. Like, I understand these companies. But I was seeing how Facebook was the front line in fighting hate. So ADL opened a center in Silicon Valley in 2017. I think we're the first civil rights group to have a physical presence. We were in Palo Alto Smart. off University Road. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I didn't, you know, I didn't put, like, some nonprofit fundraiser to run it. I recruited a guy from Reddit. The guy wow. who used to be VP for revenue products at Reddit to run it. So it's, it's staffed with software engineers and data scientists and programmers. And we engage on a day-to-day basis with all the big companies from, from, you know, from Amazon to Zoom, from like from Apple to YouTube, Google and Instagram. And of course, Facebook, we'll talk about that, and Twitter and TikTok. We're, we're working with the gaming companies and the problems there are off, off the fucking wall. No, go language. ahead, man. You can swear Sorry. on this podcast. But they're off the wall. Uh, 
and the messaging platforms. So we work with all these different kind of arenas. But to the point that you were making and to what Professor Walter said, like there's no question that while many of them, and we work with them to identify hate speech and help them understand what extremists are doing, the toughest one to work with by far is Facebook. Wow. I mean, so we do annual- So you met with uh, Mark Zuckerberg? Many times. Yeah. And, and look, like there's a lot of good people there who mean well, I would say that. I have friends who work at Facebook. Sure. But the kind of group thing that happens there is extraordinary. And whereas a lot of the companies, again, none of them are clean. They all have their issues. But we do an annual survey of online hate and harassment. We've been doing it for years. The play, And the data is crazy. 42% of people who use social media say that they've been on, bullied online. 28%. This is our 2021 survey. We haven't done this year's yet. It's uh, probably 28, worse. It's <laughs> probably worse. 28% say they've been systematically like continually bullied on or stalked or you know harassed online but the place where it happens the most facebook it happens on facebook three times as often as any other platform three times as often the instagram numbers are terrible too and while we brought this stuff to these companies again and again we had a situation in the summer of 2020 right after the death of george floyd where we were you know, my analysts watch the extremists. I mean, that's what we do. And we had extremists. They need a, they, they need a vacation. They the all analysts, do. And yeah. lots of counseling. But we saw on Facebook groups the extremists organizing to disrupt the Black Lives Matter protests. And we brought that to Facebook. And they wouldn't do anything about it. Wow. I mean, the highest value there is really freedom of expression. But I don't think. Hey, dude, it's freedom of money. <laughs> it's freedom of money. <laughs> I mean, that's, 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 <laughs> freedom that's, of that's, revenue. But like, you know, like my friend Sasha Baron Cohen says, I don't think freedom of speech equals freedom of reach. But they've allowed the lunatic fringe to go from the fringe right into the mainstream. And so I reached out to Derek Johnson, who runs the NAACP, and to Rashad Robinson, who runs a group called Color of Change. I said, yeah, we need, yeah, of course. We need to get organized. And so we launched this campaign. We Stop called it Stop Hate, Hate for, for Profit. Profit. That's right. That's you right. Know, Yes. Okay. So you kick off Stop Hate for Profit, which is a very audacious campaign. Yeah. Uh, and you do wind up with some major corporate. We had, I tell you what, when we started the campaign, we said, take, we started it in June. We said, take the month of July off Facebook. We told companies, don't advertise on Facebook for the month of July. And when we started the campaign, we had, we didn't have a single company lined up. I mean, it was very wow. audacious. Um, it's a little bit like my presidential campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Um, three weeks later, we had over 1,100 companies, the biggest brands in the world. Incredible. Coca-Cola, McDonald's, So why were Starbucks. they so receptive, do you think? What, like, I'll you, tell you exactly yeah, why. Because we gave them examples of like white supremacist and anti-Semitic and racist content on Facebook like flighted against their ads. Yeah, that's pretty convincing. So here's an Amazon ad you know, next to a dis like a bloody truck that says, let's go get the next George Floyd. Or here's a Salesforce ad or a Verizon ad and so on and so forth. And you put that out there and Howard Schultz says, I don't want Starbucks advertising alongside the Nazis. But that's what Facebook was doing. Wow. And, you know, like I've talked to them many times. I had a conversation once with Mark and he said around all of this, I think maybe this is in the book. And he said, you know, Jonathan, a few years ago, no, all of the hate content on Facebook was user reported, he said to me. Today, 88% is, is caught by our AI before users even see it. So I think we're doing pretty good. And I, was, and I said, okay, well, I used to be an executive at Starbucks. We didn't get to say 88% of our coffee doesn't have poison in it. So we think we're doing pretty good. Yeah, especially if you imagine the number of messages they're talking about. I mean, you have 12% totally. out there. 12% of an enormous number is an enormous number. <laughs> yes, that is the law of large numbers. It's huge. And as much as we knew then, I mean, you know, the way we got the concessions, all these companies came off. And then we organized with Sasha and Leo DiCaprio and Selena Gomez, the campaign to get celebrities off Instagram, Kim Kardashian. They all joined us. So for a week in August, they all got off the platform. Maybe they were grateful not to have to post for a week. Yeah, they were. I did hear that. I heard that people like, oh, my God, thank goodness. But it also is important to them. Like, it's important to their brands. It's how they engage with their fans. So those two things led 
Facebook said, okay, we're actually ready to talk. And they did what we asked. They hired a VP for civil rights, like we asked. They started classifying Holocaust denialism as hate speech, like we asked. They took off white supremacist groups, like we asked. They, they released the results of an audit. They agreed to do an audit. I mean, they did a bunch of things. It's not nearly enough. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, what do you expect? And stuff is difficult. Like, the, this is the most sophisticated platform in sure. the history of capitalism. Yes. They will earn $120 billion this year, like a 24% net margin. I mean. Yeah, you know if the balance was reversed where, look, they're making more money by getting that 88% up to 99.999% as opposed to less money. Like, you know they'd get it right. You are entirely correct. Like, that's exactly the right calculus. So the problem is, as you're saying, the incentives are totally misaligned. There's no regulatory oversight because there's a thing in the law called Section 230. And they have these written look, before Facebook was long. A, was yeah, a written in like I 1996, I yeah. think. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's this hyper libertarian ethos inside the company. And many of us might self-identify as libertarians. But there's a problem when that libertarianism involves, again, using this product and the product to literally not just target and stalk, but to you know cause physical harm to people, which we've seen happen on Facebook and on these other platforms. And you know the reality is all I would say, Andrew, to your point about the how do you get it tonight? What if it were, you know, 99.9% .9 increase their revenues? They took the Nazis off, like. You know, uh, think about J&J, &J, the big pharma company. So when they had a Tylenol scare in the 80s, right, where a few bottles of Tylenol were tampered with in Chicago, like they, they took every freaking bottle off the shelves, every bottle off every shelf in America and didn't put them back till they'd reformulated or redesigned the packaging. And it turns out that was probably not even like it wasn't even there. They could have argued like, look, this is not something that we need to, uh, you know, respond to at this scale. Correct. Yeah. Um, but they did that. Or I, you know, I used to be in the beverage business. We were talking about that. Odwalla is a, you know, ready to drink juice brand. And they had a situation where one bottle in the Bay Area, this is in the 90s, had, it was, it's a non-flash pasteurized juice. So you can get, you know, things in it, if you will, like bacteria. Whatnot. And a toddler drank a bottle of Odwalla and got E. coli and died could be lethal for a little kid. Terrible. And so what did Odwala do? They took every bottle off every shelf in America and redesigned the production process. So if Odwala can do it, if J&J &J can do it, literally one of the most innovative companies in the history of business, should they should do what every other business does. Take the product off the shelf and fix it. Like knock the Nazis off the platform. Like, it isn't that hard, actually. You know, interestingly enough, and in a timely way, there was an announcement yesterday by Facebook that they are now allowing Ukrainians to say that they want to murder Russians or they want to kill Putin. You know, they said they're now allowing that because of the war. Like, I don't want Mark Zuckerberg deciding what kind of hate speech is okay or not okay. Like, you wouldn't allow a, you wouldn't allow a Ukrainian to go on the... Uh, I don't know, on NBC or in the New York Times, right? He wants to murder all Ukrainians. Like Facebook should just abide by the same rules, the same kind of standards that every other media platform abides by. It does really boil down to Mark, doesn't it? I mean, what I hear about that company is that it's very, very centralized slash top down slash all the major decisions get, get funneled through Mark. Now, we're get, now we get to like, again, these broader issues. You know, it may seem off topic, but Mark controls 64 some odd percent of the shares. He has these crazy class A shares, give him all the voting rights. He's purged the board of all the independent directors. So there's no fiduciary responsibility there. It's the Mark show. And uh, that kind of power vested in one person. I don't know. Clearly, it's not good governance vis-a-vis yeah. -vis, like the corporate world. And again, I think it vests, the company is too big and it has too much power in any one person. Yeah, uh, if I had won the presidency, I was going to to um, I was going to go to war with the social media companies, honestly, because I just didn't see a way that you could try and bring the country together that didn't involve 
a uh, very, very significant overhaul of their business practices and, and model. Just repeal Section 230. Make yeah. them liable like every other business. If you did that and just that, now look, it may create some, there may be some, it would create some changes, right? Like maybe I wouldn't have as many, a restaurant wouldn't have as many, you know, Yelp ratings or something. But the reality is, is we can see the consequences of unbridled, unfettered, totally unregulated um, social media. And we're living with the consequences today.